Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first event in our 40th anniversary year. Thank you for attending today's webinar, and thank you all for your support of our work. During this year, we'll be hosting a number of events, including these webinars and our annual celebration. All of these events will explore our commitment to pro proving what's possible. Today, we'll explore how innovation, collaboration, and, and the relentless dedication and courage from our team and staff and donors have allowed us to tackle extraordinary challenges across four decades. These events are opportunities for critical supporters like you to meet our staff and learn more about how together we are building a healthier tomorrow for Southern Haiti. We are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year where we saw over 158,000 patient visits over the previous 12 months. However, as all of you know, this milestone has been a bittersweet one for HEI. We've made so much incredible progress, but Haiti faces an unprecedented and ongoing humanitarian crisis that continues to cripple the country. We're one of only six hospitals in Haiti that has remained fully functional over the past 12 months during the unprecedented crisis. And our 160 bed hospital today is currently completely full despite the challenges. Our hospital and community health programs have provided reliable care amid almost complete health system collapse. And all of you have made our team's incredible and heroic work possible. Today, we will be kicking off our webinar series with a look at our unique approach to responding to crises over the years with our local Haitian leadership team at the helm. I would like to now introduce our chief medical advisor at HEI, Dr. Wilfred Kade, who will give you an overview of today's presentation. Dr. Kade. Thank you, Connor. And uh, I welcome everyone to this webinar. So today we'll be presenting to you how Health Equity International has responded to crisis over the past 40 years. I'll start with the presentation and then Militsa will follow and Dr. Milian will conclude with the presentation. Next slide, please. So again, I am uh, Wilfried Kade, Chief Medical Advisor at Health Equity International. And I'm glad to spend this time with you to share some of our success stories in responding to crisis in Haiti. Crisis has affected the country in many ways and for very long. We had political crisis, economic crisis, and natural disasters. Next slide, please. Though HEI has always been a healthcare organization, it has remained close to the various needs of the communities it served. In all circumstances, it has responded at various degrees to those crises, depending on resources that we had, stages of our growth. We dealt with public health crisis outbreaks from time to time in our community. The outbreaks were mostly local and very well circumscribed. So our leadership has taken place in our capacity to research, package, and be the source of information and knowledge to our community. People turn to us for guiding them and helping them do the right thing for themselves and their families. In our early stages, there was not any community radio station, no telephone. We had to rely on the word of mouth to disseminate information. That's where we conscientiously partnered with the community. The framework for the organization response to crisis evolved over the years through learning from past interventions. But we always anchored our response in the community we serve. We trained and informed the community health agents at the beginning, we were, there were only 13. We work with the trusted voices in the community like teachers, religious leaders, and influential community leaders. Upon receiving the message, they went out and shared it with their neighbors. Introduction of the PEPFAR grant, President Bush global push for HIV eradication became a turning point. This grant coming for prevention of HIV infection and treatment of infected patients in 2005 
put the hospital on the map. Patients came from far away to receive care and services. They heard about the holistic approach of the hospital, which valued dignity of, it, of the HIV patients. Through the PEPFAR grant from the US government, we receive hardware equipment, computers, server, satellite dish. Being able to, re, to provide rapid updates during crisis allowed our partners to support the organization in its relief efforts. Next slide, please. In 2007, the board of St. Boniface Haiti Foundation, now Health Equity International, reviewed the mission and re-emphasized the focus on education and particularly community development. It was a timely move because of what was going to occur in the country. 2008 brought two bad events, the financial recession that affected the whole world and a hurricane season that brought three storms, one after the other, and those storms severely hit our communities. There were loss of human lives, houses were washed in flooding, and farms were destroyed. To live up to its revised mission, the organization engaged into resource mobilization and partnership promotion as two core elements of our response to crisis back then. We plan active outreach to our community leaders to improve participation. We also reinforce our ties with other not-for-profit organizations in the country, like Catholic Medical Mission Board, Catholic Relief Services, Food for the Poor, and Caritas Switzerland. Next slide, please. Another key moment of our organization response to crisis in Haiti occurred after the 2010 earthquake. We grew then our regional leadership. Everyone was hit directly or indirectly by the 2010 earthquake. There was a personal connection to the disaster. And this is the time for us now to publicly send our sympathy and prayers to the earthquake victims in Syria and Turkey. In the chaos of the disaster in 2010, there was a major population movement. Displaced people from Port-au-Prince to everywhere else, creating needs and putting additional burden over health infrastructure, schools as well. St. Boniface Hospital intervened in the acute phase and the recovery phase to the spinal cord injury program. And we maintain our implication also into, in the rehabilitation phase, confirming to our communities and partners that we are here to stay. Good and bad moments, we will be there for them, working with them. Next slide, please. This moment is defined by two key elements, regional leadership, extension of, of our leadership and learning. We became a go-to partner for the Haitian government, the United, the, the United Agency for International Development, the Kellogg Foundation, the Pan-American Health Organization and other United Nations agencies in the country. Our leadership grew into something transformative and also self-transformative. We influence our partners and be and beneficiaries. We actively seek out communication and coordination, which is very challenging in time of crisis, but we are also very strategic in preparation for disaster. Our self-transformation or more simply self-improvement is linked to our continued learning process, prepositioning of goods and supplies, definition of roles and responsibilities, and that goes as far as putting some tasks in the job description related to preparedness and response to crisis. Thank you. I hand it over now to Melissa to continue with the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kade. My name is Melissa Michel, the Director of Operations at the hospital. Next, please. 
I will follow up with the spinal cord injury program that we have at St. Boniface Hospital. It began in response of the 2010 earthquake where we started accepting the overflow spinal cord injury patients from the United States Naval ship, mostly called USNS Comfort. It was always, it was also helping in the Border Prince area. We partnered with USAID, the Christian Blind Mission in Germany, and external assistance from experts such as Spalding Rehab. The impact of this program is in accordance with our values, saving lives and treating people with digni dignified care. As we say in the Haitian Creole, tout monde se moun. Even though the dedicated finance program had ended and with less resources, we are continuing to provide care to the most in need Currently, we are serving more than 10 patients with comprehensive rehab services, and we can accommodate up to 16 at one time. As of December 2022, we are following 150 patients who are back in their communities. For the last six months, we provided an average of 556 physical and occupational therapy sessions per month for 71 non-NCS and SEI patients. Next slide, please. In most developing countries, the focus is mostly on primary care and emergency care has not been a priority. But we are losing people on road accidents, on people needed urgent care during nights, weekends, when outpatient clinic is not open. St. Boniface Hospital recognized the need for ER and along with their partners, USAID, American schools and hospital abroad, mostly, most likely called ASHA, with whom we had started on a tuber tuberculosis center. At the beginning, they changed their scope of work from the construction of this center to the addition of a new ER in the same building, turning it now into a facility infectious disease and emergency care. ER is a new specialty in Haiti. Only one hospital provides that emergency medicine residency program to about six residents per year. We are very proud to have three of these ER specialists. We are in place now whenever disaster strikes, which can be entirely without warning, like a major road accident or an earthquake. Next slide, please. Saturday, August 14, 2021 at 8.29 a.m., a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck Southern Haiti. Being on site, we were able to direct people out of the services and also reminded them of likelihood of aftershocks. This effort was made by the entire staff who mobilized immediately for evacuation of patients, especially the pediatrics. If it had been a weekday, there would have been more patients at the hospital. Because of our operations daily team meetings where we do some reminders of certain points on disaster or emergencies, the security team knew immediately to shut down all propane tanks at the hospital. Our facility manager, after evaluation of patients, was immediately put in contact with our Build Health International team to check for structural damage. On the clinical side, we made sure all the babies in the pediatric ward were provided a proper space on the ground and the ER was getting ready to receive patients. Health facilities across the, the South called us for help trusting our leadership and ability to coordinate. We send medicine, supplies, also ambulances to pick up injured patients. Next slide, please. Over 12,700 people were injured during the earthquake and 80% of these injuries were of orthopedic nature. Being one of the few undamaged healthcare facilities, we started receiving patients with traumatic injuries and broken bones. As a response also to the earthquake, we hosted a team of specialized orthopedic and trauma surgeons from the United States and other parts of the country. The need for this specialty was highlighted for, by the earthquake and we had at the hospital to redefine and get ready to create a permanent ortho program. Orthopedics is a specialty different from general surgery, but in site, we already had the operations room. We provided the necessary 
space for pre-op and post-op patients. For November 2021 to December 2022, we already had performed 445 ortho surgeries. We have now a space for outpatient clinic. And from November 2021 to December 2022, we received 11996 outpatient clinic visits. This helped provide follow-up and continuing care. The physical therapy and occupational therapy services are also available at the SCI and Rehab Center. This program is supported by partners, including foundations and individual doctors. We had to hire staff, and now we can host residents from other institutions in the, of the country. We still need more financial support as auto equipment and supplies are very, very expensive. Next slide, please. Currently at the hospital, we rely on generators powered by diesel flu fuel to supply with electricity. We have the capacity now to store for two months Extreme fuel shortages during the current crisis jeopardize the hospital operations. Refueling is not always available and the cost of fuel doubled. We have a small oxygen concentrator that can refill nine cylinders every 48 hours. We must purchase oxygen in Milaguan, which is 90 minutes from Fondebla, and the cost of a cylinder tripled in the past six months. Linking these two operational needs for a hospital to be fully functional, we have now an oxygen plant solar powered project financed by the Kellogg Foundation and executed by Build Health International. The solar panels will be installed on a land donated by a community leader. Solar Array, we also run high powered oxygen concentrator that can produce 50 to 100 cylinders per day more than enough for our own use. We are able to both, we will be able to both assist other facilities and provide us also with a source of income. This new ground mounted solar array will provide enough electricity to run the hospital during daytime, about eight hours per day and operate the generator only at night, reducing then fuel usage. Our fuel storage could at least now last three to four months. With this project, we will be able to operate for a long period of time of crisis. Next slide, please. Because of the increased security in the country, the only way to move supply to the hospital is by air. We established a strong relationship with the United, United Nations Humanitarian Air Service managed by the World Food Program and we can transport critical supplies and employees between Port-au-Prince and fond -Blanc. Our staff is mobilized every time the helicopter lands to unload the products. With all humanitarian agencies struggling to transport their goods, we just started to partner with Erling Airbridge to transport our supplies from abroad. We continue on a daily basis to find ways and coordinate our supply chain. Next slide, please. With climate change, increase in extreme weather events, different type of natural disaster, not only earthquakes, but also hurricanes. We have been lucky for the past two years, but we still are getting heavy rain every time. At the hospital Saint Boniface, we are in the process now of establishing a disaster preparedness committee where everyone know, will know their roles in any kind of disaster. They will also know how to respond, medical or operations. After that, we will be training all staff to be prepared for disaster. This committee will also be focusing, focusing first on hospital response and later expanding it to the Fond des Blancs community and eventually across the South to support it with the support of the Kellogg Foundation, a disaster preparedness subcommittee will provide training and support to the Southwest Corridor Alliance. It has been very challenging for people to prior prioritize this work. More of a challenge now is to motivate funders around preparedness. These next steps will increase our ability to respond when a disaster occurs. 
like in the end of this month and by early March, we will be reviewing our inventory. We will then prepare emergency kits to have on hand prior to hurricane season, which starts on June 1st. I thank you for your attention. And now Dr. Milian will present follow up on her presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Marie Midian Clermont, the Deputy Director for Saint Boniface Hospital, located in Fond -de in Haiti. Because the hospital is at the border of three departments who are at risk for several disasters like hurricanes, earthquakes, and even tsunami, as the hospital well, not very dominant in the previous disaster, we were at a good position to help other communities. We are to Haiti's devastating earthquake, St. Boniface was a small hospital. And from that bigger disaster known by the country, we chose a disaster response approach with three components. We prioritize disaster preparedness. In general, the health system is overwhelmed by the disasters. In period of calm, we train our staff, we buy medicines, supplies, water, and wood to anticipate any problem in crisis period and take action very quickly. We also learn that collaborating with Haitian government, partners, community, community actors across different sectors will be the key to be successful in any disaster response. After a disaster, you can have several groups putting together their resources to help the victim. But as an organization, who is on the field for very long term, HEI use the resources dedicated to the, dedicated to the disaster in a way to be sustainable for, for several years. And our SCI program is the best example to show how we deal in those situations. Next slide, please. The Matthew hurricane in 2016 and the COVID outbreak are two examples who can help you to better understand our strategy of disaster response. In October 2016, a hurricane, a hurricane Matthew of category seven heard the southern peninsula with more than 500 deaths and more than 500 uh, injured people. We participate in that response by, by our meeting with Haitian Civilian Protection Agency, health clusters, and collaborating with other, uh, other organizations to understand the need and coordinate our action. We did direct mobile clinic with Haitian Health Ministry and transfer to the St. Boniface Hospital any patient who needed a higher level of care. We quickly opened a second operating room sooner than we have planned, which allowed the hospital to expand surgical surgeries. The MSPP asked HEI to support in Les Anglais, Manish, and TB1 Commune, where we provide free care via mobile clinic, which help the organization to have a better understanding of the Southern Peninsula health challenges. We also coordinate community health program in those areas, including malnutrition screening, childhood vaccination with UNICEF, 
and we reach 15,000 kids. We also administer 23,000 cholera vaccination doses in collaboration with MSPP, one help the country to have a better control of the epidemic over years. Next slide, please. To be sustainable in our action, we have trained 26 new community health workers who continue to provide care in their localities and manage NTB1 even now. Because of our advocacy, other partners are implementing health programs in those communities for that moment. We build a large depot who allows us to stock medicine and materials for next disaster. We deliver more than twice the amount of visit that done we did at the time of the hurricane match. The experiences that we had from managing HIV, AIDS, and cholera epidemic put us at a good position to, to have an effective COVID-19 response. Another time partnership were a key role in our intervention. Then we partner with community leaders and organization to conduct a public health education campaign in more than 30 localities. A local organization, ADF, Association for the Development of Fonds de Blanc, help vulnerable people to respect quarantine at home and provide food to those family exposed members would not go to the market. They work also to reinforce social distancing at community events and markets. In collaboration with UNHEP International, we build a 50 bed COVID treatment center. Thanks to the support of MSPP, World Organization, Health Organization, and USAID, we were able to source critical supplies like PPE, oxygen, and tests. And the staff have cared for 500 patients. We have also administered more than 12,000 COVID-19 vaccines in our region by the end of uh, 20, 2022 years. We made that action with collaboration of MSPP, which was one of the most successful campaign in country. And the MSPP sent a team to understand our community strategy and they found that the, our community trusts in us because we are involved with them for a very long time. And because the hospital staff and leadership show the community that they received the vaccine too, and they were, they were more confident. Next slide, please. We were asked by the Ministry of Health to share our vaccine campaign best practice with a MSPP staff and other health facilities. We as oxygen is a real challenge over years, for now we are working to install our own source of oxygen because until now we depend from Port Just like other disasters, we were able to grow St. Boniface and we have been able to convert the COVID center treatment into internal medicine ward and cholera treatment center for now. Thank you for your patience with me and all the support you provide to HEI to serve the people in Southern Peninsula. Thank you, Dr. Clermont. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Dr. Cadde. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'd like to open it up now for questions uh, that our, our panel looks forward to answering. Uh, please put any questions that you have in the chat. And just as a reminder, um, to make sure that the, in the chat um, they're addressed to everyone so that we can see those questions uh, and try to answer them the best we can. Thanks, everyone.
just wait a few moments to see if there's any questions coming through. Yeah, so the, the uh, first question is um, that I'll ask um, uh, Dr. Clermont if you could take this one. We know there's a lot of challenges in uh, Haiti currently with the ongoing uh, security situation. And um, we know that it's extremely challenging uh, for everyone uh, with this uh, unprecedented situation. Um, Dr. Clermont, how is the staff uh, coping with all the challenges that are being thrown at them? A very dynamic staff, and they are very motivated because they know that the population is facing the same challenges than us, even for all the goods that the population needs. And they understand that if they don't take care of the patient, it will be worse for the population. And then they are very motivated and very understanding with all the problems that we are facing for now. Thank you, Dr. Clermont. Just looking to see if there's uh, additional questions coming through. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll uh, put this one to Dr. Kade. Um, this is from John Weary. Are there any signs of a resolution to the current crisis on a national level? Yes, um, there has been some improvement in terms of uh, security, fuel crisis. Uh, the political aspect of the crisis has not improved. We're still in a, in a kind of dead end. Uh, so, and that really affected the economy as well. But in terms of security, there has been some slight improvement. Um, even though you have to be vigilant when you go out on the streets. So, and there is some transportation uh, because of the fuel availability. So goods are being transported from different parts of the country to other parts, which really um, improves the living conditions. But um, the root causes of the crisis have not been, I would say, resolved yet. Thank you, Dr. Kade, and thank you, John, for that question. Let's look in the chat to see if anybody has any other questions as well. Uh, so uh, another uh, question will come across um, that I will uh, give to, uh, Dr. Kade as well. Um, is there anything I can do to help besides donating generously? I think it's, it's important to, I mean, in crisis, uh, um, there is a sense of despair and it's always good to have the capacity, the resources to respond, to respond. But I think the most important thing is to be prepared. And so to have the resources available now, so when the crisis hit, so we are ready to go and provide that uh, response. And one thing that we mentioned in the presentation, which is also key, is training, uh, training of our staff, um, having a roadmap very clear in how we're going to uh, respond to the, to the crisis as I mean, it, it, it can take many shapes, natural, political, economy. So yes, I would say preparedness is, is key. Training is, is one and having the resources, um, the goods, but also the money to really um, respond to the situation. Thanks yeah, for the totally, question. Yeah, thanks for the question. And Dr. Kade uh, could not agree more. And um, a shout out, Melissa, to you and your operations team and Delic and others who have made it so that uh, our supply chain has, has remained resilient throughout this crisis. We have still been able to move goods and supplies to, despite tremendous challenges, whether that's by helicopter or barge or by plane from Europe. Um, we're constantly pivoting to the most cost-effective solutions. And the funding that many of you on the call and other partners have provided to us 
gives us the flexibility to change plans and find the most cost-effective way to move critical life-saving supplies as quickly as possible. So shout out to Mutsa and team, but also a, a big thank you to partners for allowing us to be that flexible as well. Uh, additional questions? I'm seeing a question here from uh, Kyra Zimmerman. Thank you, Kyra. Um, are there any, are there lessons learned and insights you might offer from your response to the earthquakes in Haiti in 2010, 2021 that you would share with those responding to the earthquake in Turkey and Syria now? Great question, Kyra. And we're devastated. I know it brought back a lot of horrible memories seeing just how horrible the uh, devastation in Turkey and Syria is. Um, Melissa, would you like to take that question? Uh, the question being um, uh, oh, lessons I'm that sorry. we've learned from the 2010 and 2021 earthquake in Haiti, that those responding to the earthquake in Turkey and Syria might be able to uh, take from, uh, from lessons learned from our own response to earthquakes and devastating earthquakes. Uh, most of all, uh, the, the similarities that we saw in the earthquake from the 2010 most like, mostly, and the ones in Turkey and Syria, is that the building codes were not appropriate. So we saw many things happening and many of, of them fell. So, and uh, I think also uh, the preparedness is very, very important from that. And uh, uh, first interventions. So that's how we have now to proceed and uh, this is what is happening. But this pending also, we know the similarities on political crisis. So the interventions might be very difficult, but certain interventions, if the population or anyone might be uh, trained on that, it would have been maybe a faster response on the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, even in Haiti also. That's why the, the preparedness Disaster preparedness is very important for any country right now. Thank you, Melissa. And I would just add to uh, Kyra um, and to Melissa's point uh, as well. I think finding local long-term partners who've been there for the long haul and are, are best placed to discern what the needs are of the local population um, is really critical in supporting those groups. Uh, groups like, you know, we found that um, when in the 2010 earthquake, and the 2021 earthquake, the fact that our team was fully Haitian, um, knew the area well, knew the communities, knew leaders within the communities, allowed us to respond very, very quickly and uh, very effectively and getting support from the outside to be able to provide that support. And so I think looking at the, who are those local partners in Turkey and Syria that have uh, already shown that they understand uh, the local communities that have been affected and, and how can uh, that we'd be of most help to them uh, as they deal with this uh, crisis. And frankly, how we continue to deal with our crisis in Haiti now, uh, understanding the only way that we're able to continue to operate is that we have a local team that really knows how to maneuver around very, very difficult challenges. It's not to say that it's not daunting for the team, but that local understanding allows, you know, has allowed the hospital to continue to flourish uh, and community health programs despite very, very difficult challenges. Thank you, Kyra. Um, I also see a, a question. Yeah, and I, sorry, I, I, Kyra, I should just give a shout out too to you and the rest of the Global Giving team for all you're doing in Turkey and Syria now and for all the support you've provided to us as well. Thank you. Um, and I also seeing in the chat a question from John that I'll throw to Dr. Clermont. Um, Dr. John uh, asks Dr. Clermont, at the time of your last webinar update on the crisis, you let us know how your staff was coping with an in, their inability to get to their homes. How is the staff traveling, uh, coping with, uh, with uh, not being able to go home as easily now? Yes, uh, it was really challenging because when you are in crisis and you know that your family is part of the crisis, and then you 
can go home to help them. The only choice that you have it to, it's to serve the one who are closer to you. And, and then, you know, at, at some point, someone else will take care of yours. And then what we made is to help them the best we can to visit their family, to have news from their family. The staff who can go can visit them and make sure that they, someone is taking care of their families. I mean, it, Dr. Clermont, watching the team continue to either have to travel by UN helicopter home or have to stay at the hospital and continue to provide care, even though it's a day off and they weren't able to travel out on the roads, the dedication and courage of the team is truly inspiring. I know that all of us on the team feel very much fortunate to be part of a team that really has sacrificed so much to make sure that patients get life-saving uh, and, and uh, life-changing care. Just looking to see if there's any other questions as we start to wrap up here. I think we're uh, coming up on time, but I'd just like to thank all the panelists for joining us today. Dr. Clermont, Dr. Cade, Melissa, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today as well. Um, we look forward to continuing these uh, webinars on a quarterly basis. We'll continue to update you with news through all of our different platforms. Thank you all for your support. Thanks for being part of this team and, and look forward to talking again soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.